Hello and welcome back. So here's the main circuit from where we last left it. We've now got a soldered up address register. That's the first of five. We've got our temporary stand in memory. It's just a single two kilobyte ROM chip at the moment, but once we've got more address registers put together, we'll have to look at extending memory out and getting some RAM in there as well. We've got a fetch unit and well, free pipeline steps beyond that. So a total of four. This top one, still not sure if we're gonna use it or not, but we should be able to resolve that very quickly. Clock unit, um, two of our four general purpose registers, the constant register and the bus control. Now, the only major module that's not in some way represented here is the ALU. But before we can really start building the ALU, we need to work out where the data for the ALU is going to come from. Now, our data for the ALU is going to come from our general purpose registers. And we've currently got four of those in the design, but we have to work out how to get the data from the general purpose registers into the ALU. So I've spent some time thinking about this and I've looked at a variety of different possibilities. And so I'd like to explain some of those and talk about some of their relative merits before we go on and actually implement one of them. So the simplest possible thing to do is to just take two of the registers and connect them. Now, if you've looked at Ben Eater's processor design, this is exactly what he does. He's only got two registers and those two registers output directly into the ALU. And that's a really good decision for his system because he's aiming to build a very simple processor as a demonstration model. But this would be quite a terrible restriction for the design that I'd like to do. If the values were in different registers, we'd have to move them into A and B, or if they were in A and B, but perhaps in the reverse of where they should be, we'd have to add a few operations to swap them in and out. And you know, it would be a performance impediment. So I'm used to programming on architectures where I've got fairly free selection of the, the registers I've got in terms of performing operations on them. And I'd prefer to implement something more like that. So one possibility I've considered is to do something fairly similar to that. And that's we add a couple of input registers to the ALU. Now I'd call these LHS and RHS, which is kind of programmer speak for left-hand side and right-hand side of an operation. So I don't know if uh, computer architecture people have uh, different terms for these, but I'm gonna stick with that terminology. Now, wonderfully, these registers was at, would actually be a lot simpler than any of other registers we've done because we would only be writing to them and then be using the data in them directly. So we could just do that with one latch chip. But let's have a think about the, uh, the drawbacks of, of that approach. Is that say I wanted to add A and B. I'd first assert A onto the bus and instruct LHS to read. Then I'd insert B onto the bus and request RHS reads. And then presumably the ALU will perform its operation and then we'll read the result back out. But we've got a, a minimum of three cycles to do that. So our clock rate divided by three is the peak speed we can expect from that. I think we need to look at a different way of doing it. Ideally, I would like to be able to get any of these registers into the ALU without contending the main bus, because that's the obvious way to, uh, to read a value out. I was looking around at different chip options, and I came across this one. This is a four input multiplexer. And what this has got, four data inputs, and then two bits, which will select which one of those bits goes to the output. And then there's a second set over here. They use the same control inputs, but a separate output. So if I had four of these in a row, I could s select the, um, the outputs for one of those inputs. So I would need a total of eight of these chips to, to do the job. So it would look like this. We've got all of the outputs from the four registers going into the multiplexer, and then the outputs from those would go into the ALU. So this would give us what we want. By setting the uh, selection lines on these, we'd uh, have any of the four registers into any of the two ALU inputs. But that does mean that we'd have all of the, the registers coming out into wherever we put the multiplexers, and that's gonna end up being a little bit tricky from a wiring perspective, I fear. But the other issue is this wouldn't really expand very well beyond four registers. Now, I'm only expecting to have the four general purpose registers. That's not necessarily a design constraint I want to hold to in the future. Let's look at another possibility. So instead, we do this. 
each of our general purpose registers, we extend them and give them the capability to assert to two additional buses. And then we have a demultiplexer selector. In this case, I would pick the 74LS139. And that will allow us to just have the additional two buses running through each of these register chips. And this is a very expandable solution. We could turn this to eight or 16 registers and just appropriately upgrade the uh, the demultiplexer in the way that uh, we've looked at before. So this is the solution I would like to implement. Okay, so it's gonna be quite a lot of work on this board. So let's try and extract it from this mess. Okay, so I've got four more of these 541 line driver chips. Now these are exactly the same as what we used to drive the register contents back out to the, the, the main bus. We're just driving to a different bus. So I'm putting these in upside down, just same as I did with these. So the pin configurations will be the same. So there's pin one up here. So there's power. We've also got some of the output enable lines that we need to tie down. It's getting very cramped in here. Actually, I think we'd be better off tying the opposite ones down. We can use the ones that are nearer to the top for selection. Okay, so then I've got the register outputs here coming via the LEDs to the line drivers here. So we just need the same eight lines out to here and here, replicated to here. So I cut lots of wires. That's how I keep all my prepared wires before I shoot a video. Now we've got all of the inputs to these line drivers done, we need to join up the outputs to effectively create the miniature bus between the registers. Okay, that's good. I think that's all the wiring for the line drivers done. So now we need to uh, look at the demultiplexer chip. So we've actually looked at this data sheet before because the 74LS138s we're using to do the main 8-bit bus demultiplexing are on the same one. The 139 is just slightly different. Instead of a, a 3 to 8 line demultiplexer, this is a two to four line demultiplexer, but there's two of them in the sh same package. And since we've got uh, two inputs to the ALU that we want to demultiplex, that's uh, good. So we'll have four registers on each of the two inputs. Okay, so we need to extend the bus control out a little bit since we've got some additional lines. And here is our little 139. 
Something that's really awkward about these is the outputs are the reverse of the way we'd like to display them. Here we've got an enable line, which is active low. We have a second enable line on the other side, which is also active low, right where I put this capacitor. I have made up another DuPont cable, which should give us an easy way to test this. These don't have any inputs in them at the moment, so jumping around a little bit. Inputs for the first one here, and input for the second one below it, but one pin further along. In theory, I've got four data lines here, which uh, should control what's coming out. All right, I can't actually see what I'm doing back there. Let's uh, turn these boards back around. Data bus back in. Now it's not working. What is broken? Ah, load line. Okay, something's fallen off a little bit in stability here, almost certainly from me moving all the cables around. I may need to do a little bit of loose connection checking. Could be a power issue as well. Yeah, no, that was a power issue. I'm going to need to put a little bit of effort into tidying up all these cables at some point. A lot of these control lines here could probably be improved quite a bit. Okay, so over here we've got our four outputs. So if I go and poke these into the bottom four bits of the program counter, we can see we've got these four lines going in sequence, and then these four lines going in sequence after that. So that's good, that's working. Now we need to wire those same outputs into the line selectors. So if this is going to be A, then that's the first selector, and then left hand side and the second line on LHS needs to come down to the second register here. This is the output enable lines I'm setting. Then up here that will be A definitely need to tidy these wires up. No matter how many neat little wires I cut, I can never seem to keep it tidy. There's the output enable line for right hand sides done. Okay, so now we need to see if we can work out how to demonstrate these. And technically these are control lines. So they should be green. Control lines should be blue, but I haven't been able to get any of these in blue. I've got a couple of other projects, uh, well, intermediary stages on this project to disassemble because we're going to need a couple more than these to get the ALU fully done. Let's get these set up.
Every single time I make up Japan cables, I end up wishing I'd made them slightly longer. But they're also a real annoyance to cable manage. But it would be a total nightmare to get the uh, our new ALU input bus outputs all the way over here otherwise. Right, let's pause the processor and see if we can get to grips with what this is doing. Also, for those who express an interest, this is the other place I'm reaching when I lean off to the side. So here's our four new control lines. And I currently see A and B have nicely distinct values in them. So we're getting B if I set that to 1. And we're not getting A at all. So I'll look at the other one. So I'm getting B and I do get A for that one, but that should give me A. So this is right hand side, that LED is on, let's check this, ground is in the right place. Hang on, let's... Okay, my guess is we just happened to uh, line up on a LED that hadn't been wired correctly. So this is third line down. It does look like we might have two in there. Okay, well, hopefully you can see what we've got here. We've got two binary bits for each of these controls, and if we set it to the address of the register, we get that register into the input. Now, I've made a mistake in the wires here, but I'm not going to subject you to me debugging that, so I'll, um, I'll probably pull a couple of these wires out and... Uh, and, and fix them up, but the actual principle of the circuit that we wanted to engage in is working. So this gives us a, a nice grounding to start work on the ALU, so we'll build that out here and hopefully get some uh, real math operations into the uh, processor. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Yeah, I was right. It was just a simple wire plugged in the wrong place there. So we can swap these around and obviously if we had four of these registers, the four different perm the four different permutations on each of these lines would let me select any of the four onto here. Okay, so actually, thanks for watching and uh, goodbye.